I mean, there was a time when being a few standard deviations above the mean in intelligence didn't get you very much when you're just plowing the field alongside your neighbors. But now you can start a software company or a hedge fund. Okay, and this leads to astonishing levels of wealth inequality and cultural isolation. This is a theme that Murray has returned to in his other work, and in a more recent book, Coming Apart, which we also discuss. Now, unfortunately for Murray, what we have here is a set of nested taboos. Human intelligence itself is a taboo topic. People don't want to hear that intelligence is a real thing, and that some people have more of it than others. They don't want to hear that IQ tests really measure it. They don't want to hear that differences in IQ matter, because they're highly predictive of differential success in life. And not just for things like educational attainment and wealth, but for things like out-of-wedlock birth and mortality. People don't want to hear that a person's intelligence is in large measure due to his or her genes, and that there seems to be very little we can do environmentally to increase a person's intelligence, even in childhood. It's not that the environment doesn't matter, but genes appear to be 50 to 80% of the story. People don't want to hear this. And they certainly don't want to hear that average IQ differs across races and ethnic groups. Now, for better or worse, these are all facts. In fact, there is almost nothing in psychological science for which there is more evidence than these claims. About IQ, about the validity of testing for it, about its importance in the real world, about its heritability, and about its differential expression in different populations. Again, this is what a dispassionate look at decades of research suggests. Whatever the difference in average IQ is across groups, you know nothing about a person's intelligence on the basis of his or her skin color. That is just a fact. There is much more variance among individuals in any racial group than there is between groups. So, besides being unethical and politically imprudent, it is totally irrational to treat people as anything other than individuals. Murray and Hernstein were absolutely clear about this in the bell curve. So, what happened to Murray, as far as I can tell, has had nothing to do with errors of scholarship, of which, undoubtedly, there must be some, or for the way he's conducted himself since, or for his personal motives for discussing these topics in the first place. Rather, his scapegoating has been entirely the result of his having merely discussed differences in human intelligence at all. Now, it's certainly true that the definitions of both intelligence and race are open for debate, to some degree. And there can be cultural influences in the concepts we use that we don't totally understand. But the efforts to invalidate the very notions of general intelligence and race have been wholly unconvincing from a psychometric and biological point of view, and are obviously motivated by a political discomfort in talking about these things, on points about which there is virtually no scientific controversy. <laughs>